I am your stepping stone to the presidency, Atiku tells Igbo Nation. And the EFCC responsible for my ordeal in UK, Ekweremadu tells court, as court is to decide vacation order on temporary forfeiture of Ekweremadu's properties on January 25. This is PLOS Politics. My name is Nyamgul Agaji. Al Haji Atiku Abubakar, the People's Democratic Party's nominee for president, and Ifanyu Kowa, the governor of Delta State, visited Anambra State on Thursday to continue their campaign. The PDP candidate met with the state governor, Professor Chukuma Soludo, at the governor's lodge in Amobia, Amobia rather, under strict security after arriving at Ekweme Square in Oka at around 2.10 p.m. Atiku made a commitment to his followers to bring Nigerians together by treating each zone fairly and ensuring everyone's security. Also speaking during the rally, a former vice presidential candidate, Senator Ben Obi, said Atiku decided to pick Ifanyo Kowa because Ohaneze had directed that no Igbo man from the southeast should be picked as deputy to anyone. According to him, Atiku had been friends with the Indigo, even as a vice president of the country, and decided to pick an Igbo man from Delta State. He also promised to dredge the River Niger and make Onicha a functional seaport. We have joining us to discuss this, Ose Aneni, a PDP chieftain. We're glad to have you on the program, Ose. Always a pleasure. Okay. Uh, well, uh, Thank God that you are a chieftain of the PDP. How is Atiku really a stepping stone to the Igbo presidency? <laughs> I think, uh, well, again, thank you for having me. And these types of statements, you know, when you, when you take them out of context, they sound um, a little bit curious. Um, what Atiku actually said was that he's a stepping stone to, um, he's the most viable stepping stone to an Igbo presidency because um, every time he has run, he has he has run with an Igbo man. He ran with Senator Ben Obi. He ran with um, Governor Peter Obi, and he's currently running with Governor and Senator Ifan Yokoa. And even beyond the fact that he runs with, he always runs with um, someone from an, an Igbo man. It's the fact that you know he makes, and I think a very valid argument that he's the only one determined after his presidency, if he ever assumed office, to deliberately work for a Southeasterner to become president uh, of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. We haven't really ever had a president since, I think, Namdi Azikiwe, who was by and large a ceremonial president. You know, so he is committed to that. He's, he's, he's committed to it, um, not just by the fact that he has run with Igbo vice presidential candidates, but that he has publicly and verbally and vocally and consistently said that if if he ever becomes president, the person that will su succeed him would be an Igbo man. Um, but again, you know, I was I was happy you, you picked up on, on, I think, the most significant statement he made about making the Southeast, you know, an economic powerhouse. Uh, Atiku intends to use the private sector to drive uh, Nigeria's economic growth. And he has said he would dread the River Niger and he will actually create a port in on nature if you come president so that you know the south is again you know it doesn't just become a manufacturing hub our trading hub that it relies on ports in port Harcourt or lagos but actually becomes a, an engine of growth for imports and exports and production um so it excites me you know um, my mom is from Amorbia, not Amorbia, and I, I'm sure she she she'll be happy I've corrected the pronunciation of <laughs> yeah, her, Amorbia. her village. Amorbia, <laughs> yes. Um, so for me, it's it's almost like a homecoming. You know, I'm from Edo State, but like I said, my mom is from Anambra State, from Amorbia. You know, and we are truly excited, not just at um, an Atiku presidency, but but for what it means for the entire Southeast and for Igbos in general. 
But I don't know how we can hold Atiku as a man of his words. Uh, we will come to that anyway. Is it not supposing by this statement that he's saying it's only the PDP that can produce an Igbo president? What of the many other parties that we have even at this time? So um, two things um, to this. The APC just uh, finished fielding um, a northern president. And the right thing the APC should have done, if they were going to be fair, you know, and in answer to your question, would have been to zone the presidency to the southeast. They didn't zone it, so everybody contested. Um, you know, so you cannot look at the APC as an option. The second thing is that in a democracy, you really only have ever have two main political parties that can ever uh, secure power. There was a recent um, projection by. SBM Intelligence, they are Nigeria's premier data and intelligence consultancy firm. And they said, you know, if things remain as they are, um, Peter B and Labour Party have no route to, route to power. Um, they are actually pre predicting a runoff between uh, APC and the PDP. Um, so, and, and that sort of is unfortunately just the nature of first past, of, past the post electoral democracies. You have two main contenders. And if you are lucky, you have a third force party that can flip or tip the scales one way or the other. And I think, you know, in, in reality, you know, that's Peter Abi's role in this election. He's a third force candidate who, if he decides to either align with the APC or the PDP, will almost surely guarantee the victory of whoever he aligns with. Um, because he's from our fold, because he's one of us, because you know his his manifesto is almost a copy of everything we want to do. We hope that, um, God forbid, we don't win the election at the first ballot. We will be able to form an alliance with Peter Obi and the Labour Party. I don't know when when you said Peter Obi is part of you. I don't know how uh, that will be something to rejoice about because Atiku can be claimed by APC as well as being as uh, part of them. So. We should be talking about the party that they are belonging to now. Otherwise, we can be classifying Atiku as an APC member by proxy as well. Uh, no, or, origins matter, I think. Um, and ideological foundations matter even more so. Atiku is a PDP member. He's a foundational PDP member. As um, so, A lot of people will not know that even before Peter Abi joined Abga, he was actually a PDP member. Um, he left for Abga. Um, did his stint as governor and immediately returned home um, after his tenure as governor in Anambra State. So again, ideologically, um, Peter Abi is one of us. Um, again, you know, the data says he has no route to power. Uh, we hope to win at the first ballot, uh, but even if we don't, we think we can form an alliance with Peter Abi. Okay, my concern right now is that our founding fathers brought what they call federal character so that uh, no ethnic group, no section of the, the country will be uh, marginalized, whether really or perceived. And PDP came in 1999 and brought what gladdened our heart, and they called it uh, zoning, which may not be part of our constitution, but they th thought it fit to zone. But when it came to the 2023 election, the PDP did some abracadabra, and a lot of people have said that the person behind this was Atiku Abubakar. He didn't want the zoning because naturally, whether it was PDP that was leaving office or not, it didn't matter. The presidency should have come to the south. But Atiku Abubakar made sure, according to speculations, that, okay, it was thrown open so that he too can get it. And this is someone who is preaching unity. How can a man like that bring unity? Let us... Walk us through the qualities of Atiku Abubakar that will make us have the confidence that if he gets the power, he will work for the unity of the country. Um, so before I do that, um, I'll just take you on a brief historical tour. Um, you're absolutely correct. In our party constitution, we do have rotational presidency. But if you remember, when Obasanjo finished in 2007, um, it was Peter Odili um, from the South who was actually the front runner for the PDP. Mm -hmm. And if Obasanjo had not single-handedly intervened, we would have had um, a Yoruba presidency and then a Niger Delta presidency. Um, fast forward to um, John, um, Yaduwa's presidency, when he finished, um, it didn't go to the 
it didn't go back to the north. Um, Good Lord Jonathan decided to run in 2011. Um, Atiku contested against him. He didn't leave the party. In 2015, many people don't know that even though there were agreements that power was supposed to go back to the north, um, the PDP only printed one presidential form. In fact, some candidates took us to court at the time and in almost single-handedly installed Jonathan as our, our candidate, which was why a lot of people left at the time. So I'm saying, you know, we observed these things in breach. Uh, it was cured in 2007 by Obasanjo. In 2011, it wasn't cured. Power was supposed to go to the north. We violated the agreement. In 2015, it was supposed to go to the north. We violated the agreement. And so when you come to 2023 and you say it's Atiku Abubakar that has, you know, been the one to, to turn away and is only an agreement, it's not uh, historically accurate. I just wanted to make that point. Um, to why he is a unifier, it simply is because he is the only candidate pushing a message of national unity. We have seen one candidate come out and say it's the turn of the Yorubas, it's Emi Lokan. We have seen other candidates go to churches and say this is their turn. The only candidate pushing a pan-Nigerian message saying even though I am a northerner, I want to run a presidency for all. And even though or even when I win government, I know Nigeria's problems are so deep rooted that I will need to form a government of national unity that brings together everybody from all pol political spheres of life and all ideological spheres of life as well. He's the only person pushing that message loudly and consistently. Our manifesto is five points. And the first one is unity. Then you have security, the economy, education, and restructuring. Unity is first because Atiku has consistently said that unless we, we unite ourselves as a nation, because we've never been this deeply divided since perhaps the Civil War, that unless we unite as a country, we cannot solve any of the issues, whether it's security, whether it's restructuring, whatever it is, because we must unite this nation before we're able to build the consensus we need to push through the constitutional amendment we are promising to make. So, you know, literally the success and failure of any party's manifestos, whoever, whoever wins, lies on the ability to unite this country. And the only person that has shown that he has the political weight and the will to unite this country, to build a network, to build consensus across this nation is Atiku Abubakar. And that's why I support him. And from the Niger Delta, he has told me in a room where I was that he will push for resource control. He will push for state police. Those are things that matter to me as someone from the South South. Today he was in the Southeast and he was speaking to an economic regeneration. Those are the things that perhaps matter to them. He was speaking to a sense of belonging that regardless of where you are from, if you are from the Southeast, you too can dream of becoming president. Everywhere this man goes, he speaks to the things that cut to the hearts of people. Um, I'm confident that this message will resonate um, come February 2023. And I'm confident that he will not only unite this, this country, but recover our lost prosperity. Well, when you talk about the political will, uh, so many people will argue with you. They will have some divergent uh, views about political will to do something that is really uh, tough. Political will means that you have the, the, the resolve to, to take a stand, no matter how difficult that decision might be. Now, I give two instances. The first instance is the case of Deborah in the North that was killed. And someone, according to your principle, said, uh, wrote and condemned it. And he came and deleted it. And that was after a few comments came from some people that he has lost the vote of the Northerners. And it was deleted. Yes, he has said a lot of times that it was because he didn't, um, he didn't sanction the tweet. But we know that someone who is handling your, your t social media handle should be someone who at least knows a little bit about your mind. That's the first one. The second one is that till now, there's a lingering crisis that has produced a G5. And we've not been able to resolve that. The person in question is the head of PDP. So he cannot be the judge and the prosecutor, the guilty one, everybody all in one. So we cannot hold him that he's not uniting the party. But Atiku, who is the presidential candidate for the party, is expected to be the one to, to unify the party. And he's not able 
till this moment to do that. In fact, it has gone to the stage that the other governors, the five governors, are campaigning for some other people. So, how would you call this man a man of unity? We, we, I just want you to keep telling us <laughs> and assuring us how he can be a man of unity when he cannot unite his party and he cannot take a stand, no matter what or whose ox is God, as they say. Um, so, very, I would say very loaded questions. I'll try to um, answer them as best as I can. I'll take probably the easiest one, uh, which is the Deborah tweet. Uh, as you are aware, he, he had a town hall recently uh, broadcast nationally where he, he condemned her killing and went even further than condemning her killing by saying that, you know, nowhere in Islam is jungle justice allowed. Um, and he, he, he urged that the, the perpetrators be brought to book. And I think maybe that's the, the important point. We sort of have capitalized, or certain sections of the political class have capitalized on this poor deaths, uh, this poor girl's death. Mm. They do not care about her. They do not care about her parent. They do not care about justice. All they want to do is whenever Atiku comes out to speak or, or his surrogates like myself come out to speak, they hit us across the head with the question, why did he delete the Deborah tweet? Mm. And like Atiku said, I'll just repeat what, what, what he, he has stated repeatedly, is that he has a process um, of, of signing off on his tweets. And he was not reachable when that incident happened. And just like you said, someone assumed he would be okay with it and then they put out the tweet. Recall that at the time, you know, sometimes we, we, we don't connect real world occurrences with the online world. At the time, they were about to burn the palace of an emir. At the time, they were about to start lynching people in, in Sokoto. And there was no clarity about who was responsible or what had happened. And so many people did not speak. Many people didn't speak. And so when he found out that the tweet had been put out, he deleted it. But he has come out publicly and repeatedly to condemn her killing, and he has called for her murder, um, for her killers to be prosecuted and brought to justice. You know, so it's, it's unfortunate. I know it's political season, and people will, will try and capitalize on where they can. They've seen this poor girl's death as a, 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 probably a, a weapon they can use to weaken at Tiku's candidacy. Um, it's very cynical. Um, and now that he has once again come out to publicly condemn it, I hope we can we can let the girl rest in peace. Okay. On the G five governors, you you yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And only, you can only do so much to make peace. Um, Atiku has met Wiki about five times. He has met him in Abuja. He has met him with Jerry Ghana. He has flown out of the country to meet him at Wiki's behest. You know, and there's only, again, there's only so much you can do. And when people start making requests that um, on the surface or on the face of it make no sense, you know, you start to, to ask, ask yourself whether they're acting in good faith. So Wiki ostensibly is saying that, you know, he wants the party to be balanced, so are you should go. Now, that's his, his point. But the PDP constitution says, if Ayu goes, Ayu is a Christian from the Middle Belt. If Ayu goes, he's going to be replaced by a Muslim from the Northeast. So how does Ayu's removal cure what Wiki says his problem is? And Atiku has said he's a man of process. He's a believer in the constitution. And there's a process for removing the chairman. He is not beholden to Ayu. Ayu has to go, Ayu will go. But these steps have to be followed constitutionally. You ask about will because you said why does how do we know if uh, Tiku has uh, uh, political will, will yeah. because he said a tweet. I want to speak about one of the things that probably cost Tiku the presidency in 2007. He was one of the leading fighters against Obasanjo's third term bid, if you recall. In, in fact, he left. The, he was driven out of the party. Um, Tiku was locked out of the villa. Obasanjo fought him. Because Atiku said he wasn't going to compromise on our constitution or on, or on our democracy, even if it was going to cost him personally, which it did. So, you know, when you talk about political will, I don't think anybody to date has shown that type of resilience. Since 2007, the presidency has, has eluded him because he refused to compromise or bow to Basson just pressure. So if we're talking about a man that has strength and will, 
He has, he has shown it time and time and time again. A lot of people don't even remember that when Sharia was first introduced by Abbasanjo, Atiku was one of the people that pushed against it because he called it political Sharia to the point that he was even stoned when he went to the north. So, you know, you, you talk about Deborah's tweet. In 2016, a woman was killed in Kano. She was beheaded. She was a Christian. They accused of her of blasphemy. Those tweets are still up. He sanctioned it, and he condemned her killing, and again asked that the, the killers be brought to book. So it's, it's, it's um, you know, it, it, it's funny when I hear people say Atiku does not have the will, or he's playing, you know, he's, he's just playing politics. Restructuring is deeply unpopular in the North. Atiku is the only person that goes to the North and says, I will restructure Nigeria because he said it will benefit us in the long run. It's deeply unpopular, but his, his, his consultants will say, when you go to this place, don't talk about restructuring, because message, you know, the, the polls show that it's not popular there. But he goes there and says, look, if you vote me in, I'll restructure this, this country. Removal of fuel subsidies, deeply unpopular. Article the only person going in and saying, if you vote me in, I will remove fuel subsidy because we can no longer afford it. So he's, he's broaching unpopular positions head on, even though they might cost him pop, um, politically. You know, so, so I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not concerned at all about his program because I don't think he's speaking politically. I think he's very clear about what he wants to do. He has a clear vision of how to get Nigeria working again. And he, like he said to the Guild of Editors, he actually has draft executive bills ready to go from day one on how he wants to restructure this country. It's going to be difficult. You need the National Assembly and State Assemblies to push through constitutional amendments, which is why it's important, I think it's, it's vitally important to have a candidate who becomes president who can build consensus in the National Assembly and across 24 states of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Okay, well, there, there, there were some, so many other questions uh, regarding that unity of a thing, um, but we have to trash other issues and our time is up already. Uh, but let's just, just take a peek. If you cannot answer all of them, just take a peek. Uh, he talked about security. He talked about the economy. He talked about so many things that we are feeling like it's now a deja vu even because we've heard this. Economy will be better. The Naira will become one Naira to one dollar. The security will be everywhere. And uh, everything that we heard prior to this time, uh, the government seems to have failed. So people say talk is cheap. So just tell us, walk us through the various steps that he's going to take, maybe just for security, because without security, the economy cannot grow. Uh, everything hangs on security. So what is he going to do specifically to bring about this security that he is talking about? Because from security, you can get unity, you can get economy, uh, working, and every other thing. Like right now, farmers don't go to the farms anymore because there's no security. So food insecurity will set in. People can't make money anymore, and so many other things. So what particular things is he going to do to give us this security that we, much, we so much desire in our country today? So the first thing I think is important to note, like I said, is political season. So everybody will say what they think you want to hear. I've heard Tinubu talk about um, state police, for instance. I've heard Peter Obi talk about it. Um, this is a book on restructuring uh, Tiku. Um, it's a compilation of his speeches. The first speech goes back to, I think, uh, about 1999. And in this book, he talks about restructuring this country. He actually talks about you know, the, the, in the independence of INEC and you know, making sure their funding is a first-line charge. And what he has consistently said about security is that states should be responsible for their own security. The Constitution recognizes state governors as chief security officers, mm -hmm. but they don't have command and control of the police or the armed forces. So Article proposal is a very simple one. He says, look, the federal government will be in charge of the military, and the military will be focused on protecting Nigeria's ter territorial integrity from internal and external aggression. But states should be able to control and command their own police forces so that they can resolve and attend to local policing issues. There's no reason why soldiers are at checkpoints or chasing armed robbers. That's a local policing issue. Any state that can do it should. 
um, you talk about so so that's for him that's his basic security plan. The problem with Nigeria is not just that we have been hearing people saying the same thing all over and over again. Is that our problems because we haven't tackled them, haven't changed. So that's why you hear politicians come in and say the same solution because the problems are not changing. Okay. The economy is very simple. He says um, the private sector is going to drive economic growth. Article did it as head of the economic management team in 1999. We took over GDP growth and military of 0.56, I think. In three years, he had, he had grown into 15.5%. And it was a very simple tactic. He used the, the small and medium scale enterprises to do it. Article created Smidan, if you recall. It was under the Article and Ambassador Presidency. That was what powered that growth. Okay. In just now, I think Smedan just, released a Just report. wrap it up, wrap it up, please. Yeah. Okay, so recently Smedan released a report saying the small and medium scale enterprises, we've lost about 2 million of them. 2 million, not jobs have been lost. We've lost about 2 million, million companies. And Atiku is saying, you know, our problems are the same. I've solved them before. Trust me so that I can solve them again. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we wish your principal and yourself luck when it comes to, or uh, when we get into 2023. Uh, but um, you. Uh, as you go forward, you also advise uh, so that um, uh, we will be, we will start hearing channels that will be created when or if he gets into office for people to uh, say their concerns, ask the relevant questions and get the answers because we don't seem to find that in our polity right now. We don't have avenues that we can hold government to account and every other thing that we we'll want them to uh, talk to us about. So, Osea Neni, thank you so much for being a part of the show today. Always a pleasure. Thank you, my brother. Okay, we'll take a short break now and when we return, we'll be looking at the organ harvesting case of the former deputy president and moves to forfeit his assets. Stay with us.